I have one more week to preach. It feels strange. I didn't see it coming this quickly. And um, I know you didn't either. And I know I got like eight or nine more messages in 1 Corinthians 13 to bring, so I'm going to get maybe half of that done. Next week I want to preach the message I brought when you interviewed me about 27 months ago or so from John chapter 4. That seems to be my new way of doing things. My coming in message has become my going out message, but I, I think John chapter 4 and the woman at the well and the challenge to see the people far from God all around us and engage them is, is uh, never, never ending. So that's what I'll go out with. Today I've jumped ahead a word or two in 1 Corinthians 13 to the one that I've been chomping at the bit to tear into because I, I think it's just so critically important in the lives of followers of Jesus. But before I begin that, let me just talk about my wife a little bit. I don't know what it is about Kim, but she seems to be a magnet for criticism going way back. I mean, we had only been married a few years, and my oldest sister, who is a bit of a, I don't know, how do you say whack job without being impolite? <laughs> She's got issues. <laughs> and I don't know what she had a beef about with my wife, but Chuck Fordyce, the guy that led me to Christ and baptized me at the Bucksmont Christian Church in April of 1979, got wind of it and sat my wife and my oldest sister down in his study one day to resolve the interpersonal issues between them. And my Get the book. My sister pulled out a notebook, page after page of offenses. And Chuck just sat back, I'm told, and there was nothing that he could do. It didn't end there. Years later, we were at a ministry in, um, in Maryland, and I was the associate pastor, and the senior pastor's wife had issues with my wife, and there was a mediator. We actually, I think, paid a mediator to kind of help these women sort it out, which, which is biblical. I mean, if you read the, the epistles, Paul talked about some women that were not, but men can mess it up too, not being sexist here. But the minister's wife came into the meeting and it was like deja vu all over again. Out came the notebook, page after page of things that she had supposedly said that were insulting or offensive. Some of them were actually borderline obscene and that is not where my wife goes. Her mind does not go there. And again, that was a, a really weird moment. We did a discipling time in Pennsylvania, in, Phil in Philadelphia. I've told you some of those stories. And discipling, we were very excited about that. We were uh, following the pattern of what was called at that time the International Churches of Christ, and they were headquartered in Boston. And we loved the idea that people were really challenged to, to not just sit in a pew, but be involved in daily discipleship and ramped up for Jesus. And that's, we, we love that. And yet, our senior minister's wife, in her discipleship times every week with Kim. We had three girls, seven and under. Out would come the notebook. You said this to Bethany. You said that to Mickey. And instead of building her up and making her want to be a better mom, what do you think it did? It crushed her to the point where she just stopped going to those discipling times and then had to deal with being told she didn't have a, a good heart. How about you? Have you ever had someone in your life whose spiritual gift was keeping track of all the ways you'd offended or disappointed them? And you could never win. You, you just could never offset all the evil deeds you had done. 
Do you remember how that made you feel? It's pretty easy, isn't it? We're in 1 Corinthians 13, as I've said for several weeks. Aaron Chambers out in Colorado has preached a series through this, 16 messages on each of the descriptors that Paul gives of what is love. And, and we often think of the, the chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians used at weddings, and we put them on nice plaques on walls, but they were, it was written to churches, to a church in particular that couldn't get along with itself. And Paul was exhorting them to not be so spiritually puffed up and proud, but if you have all those gifts, but you don't have love, you're nothing. And, and he asked two questions of his church over and over. How can we love each other better? And that's what I want to leave with you. What's the love quotient among this congregation? And how can that be improved? And how can we take this out and love our community? How do we show the love of Jesus? Better. As a matter of fact, a couple weeks ago when Aaron was preaching the series, uh, he gave everyone in the congregation a gift card with a sleeve that held it that had an invitation to his church. And he invited them just to give them out to people who they didn't know and who didn't go to church anywhere. Just as a way of showing love to the community. And today we come to what is probably one of the biggest love busters of all. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, again, the CEV version. Paul says, what if I could speak all languages of humans and angels? If I did not love others, I would be nothing more than a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. What if I could prophesy and understand all secrets and all knowledge? And what if I had faith that moved mountains? I would be nothing unless I loved others. What if I gave away all that I owned and let myself be burned alive? Well, that's some heavy commitment right there. I would gain nothing unless I loved others. And remember, we had the symbol from the Napa school. (laughs) I just beat that thing until you all ran out of here crying, stop it, stop it. He goes on, love is kind, and we talked about doing random acts of service, and love is patient, and we talked about love has a, a long fuse, it does not get angry easily. We talked about love is never jealous, it doesn't boil over with anger, love is not boastful. It doesn't destroy community by over-celebrating self. Love is not proud. It's, it's not over-inflated with self-importance. We said that love is not rude, and I told you about the macaroni grill server, Dave, who, when I asked him about the people coming on Sunday, said they're tedious, rude, impatient, and cheap. And I implored you that if you're that way at your restaurants, please tell them you go to the Baptist church. He said, love isn't selfish or quick-tempered. Those are the ones I'm skipping. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs that others do. Love rejoices in the truth, but not in evil. Love is always supportive, loyal, hopeful, and trusting. Love never fails. That's a tall order, because even as I read this, I'm thinking, oh, I blew it there, I blew it there, I blew it there. I'd like to think I'm loving. I'm, I'd like to think I'm Christ-like, but man, against this white-hot spotlight of truth, I can only admit I got, a, I got a lot of work to do. And God has a lot of work to do in me. I'll blame it on him. God hasn't done his job. It's safe to say that all of us have had difficulty forgiving someone somewhere in our lives for the stupid, sinful, hurtful things that they've done to us. It's safe to say that all of us have had difficulty (laughs) forgiving people for the stupid, sinful, hurtful things they've done to us. And you probably had difficulty getting forgiveness for all the stupid, sinful, hurtful things you've done. It's it's a two-way street. We've all done stuff that we're embarrassed about or we're ashamed of. I put a question on Facebook. I was quite disappointed at the response. The question was, what are some things you've done that you're really ashamed of or embarrassed about? And the first response was, is this a trick question? You expect us to put that on Facebook? (laughs) 
Would you agree that we've all done stupid stuff, sinful stuff? Would you agree that if someone wanted to, they could fill a book with wrongs against you? They could hold it against you? Let me ask you a question. How many of you are living with someone who's walking around with a list of all the wrong things you've ever done, or maybe lived with? Maybe you broke free of that, and we'll talk about that at the end. Or how many of you are walking around keeping a list of all the wrong someone has done to you? Watch the elbows. Remember the Bob Newhart classic, where he was a counselor. You can Google this, but it's his classic, stop it. And that's his advice to everything. That's my counseling technique, by the way. So save your, don't come to me for counseling. I'm terrible because I'm just going to listen to you and just say, well, knock it off. Just stop it. But I use that here, Bob Newhart. If you're walking around keeping a list of the wrongs that everyone else has done against you, please do them a favor, do yourself a favor and just knock it off. Stop it. That's as far from love as you can possibly get. So why do we do this stuff? Why do we keep a record of wrongs? It's simple. It comes down to power. It gives me power over you to be able to point to where you've messed up. And in some sick, twisted, toxic way, that makes me feel good. And that's not how God intends you to feel good about yourself. It's why Jesus went to the cross. And we'll touch on this when we get to the end, when we do communion together. The law of Moses was being used in the days of Jesus as a weapon by the legalists to punish people. The purpose of the law was good. The purpose of the law was to make us appreciate grace. The purpose of the law was to make us realize we can't keep the law. We need another way out. And some people never got that message. In Jesus' day, they put them on the cross. But even today, there's lots of Christians, even lots of churches that have this list of do's and don'ts. And boy, you better measure up or you're in deep weeds. That's not the purpose of the law. Not a single human being has ever come close to keeping the law. So Paul wrote in Romans, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the Jewish leaders in Jesus' day, what I like to call the mucky yucks, they used the law to beat their people up with their own sinfulness. It gave them power. Because they had one of these. My record of wrongs. I kind of self-made it. But do you have one of these? And the Jewish leaders would walk around and they would just observe the lives of their people and they'd, they'd see you doing what they consider to be work on the Sabbath and there it goes. They'd, they'd, they'd have a record. Thing is, I could follow you along all day long. Listen to your phone conversations. Watch how you interact with your closest family members. Stand behind you as you look at your computer screen or your smartphone screen. And I bet you I could fill page after page. It happened this week, as a matter of fact. I was terribly offended right here at church. A young man whose name shall not be mentioned, but who's sitting in the sound booth, helped set up our new soundboard, and, and I got him a burrito. And as I ordered this burrito, I, I said, now this is like extra spicy from Guadalajara food truck across from Les Schwab. They are the best Mexican food in town, by the way. You go there, just tell them that the orange-haired guy sent you. I said, this is really spicy. He said, I'm man enough to handle anything you can. I said, you won't be able to kiss your wife for two days because your lips will be on fire. He says, I don't have a wife. Bring it on. <laughs> so I did. I brought it on. I went out. I picked up two extra spicy burritos with the extra chili oil stuff drizzled on it. And we sat right back there. And I was about done with mine. He was about a quarter of the way through with his. And I'm thinking, you usually eat a lot faster than that. And I'm like, what's going on? He said, you lied to me. You're killing me. So I would never kill you. I love you. And then I noticed, horror of horrors, he was pulling off the little jalapenos. 
the best part of the burrito. He's setting them down on the side. And, whoa, 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 whoa. You told me you could handle this. Put them back. And he did. And he did eventually complete the entire burrito after downing the bottle of pineapple soda that I had got him and three <laughs> glasses of water. <laughs> I will never forget that. That's going right here. Jalapenos, Blake. Little liar. <laughs> the Pharisees and the Sadducees of Jesus' day, they were experts. They would follow you all day and keep a record of everything you did wrong. They loved to remind people that they had failed. And religion's good at that. Let's just be honest. Religion is really good at controlling their people through guilt. It happens now. It, it happened in history. It happened in Jesus' day. Kim and I are just finished watching last week. I think it was on Hulu, a, a special series on the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints, FLDS, which is located down there south of uh, southern Utah, northern Colorado. And they're a big polemic. They marry a lot of women. And Warren Jeffs, and they marry young age, un illegal age women, and they finally caught them. We were watching that, but you've got all these women. I mean, they have 20, 30, 40 wives per husband, and they are okay with that. And it's because of the control that the prophet had over every aspect of their life. And they kept a list, and they were not afraid to use it. This sort of thing really ticked Jesus off. As a matter of fact, the only time he ever expressed anger in the Gospels, he didn't get mad. We had a fun dinner the other night with some of our old neighbors there at Alderbrook, and it was quite the collection of individuals. We've got a Catholic, we've got a Lutheran, we've got a former Christian church of our stripe, uh, we've, we've got, uh, he's either an atheist or a very strong agnostic. And we've got a universalist, Unitarian type. He's actually got a minister. So a, quite an eclectic group of, of people there. And it's interesting over the two years to watch the, the agnostic guy who was pretty hostile at first. And now he's really softened up to us. But we were, we were talking about this very thing about how I, I was making the point. I might have even been telling him what was coming Sunday because he was kind of interested about the only people Jesus got mad with. The only, he said, yeah, he flipped things over in the temple, I think is what it, what it was. That's, yeah, he got mad at people that were abusing religion. Jesus didn't get mad at the run-of-the-mill sinners. He didn't get mad at the drunks and the addicts and, and the prostitutes and the people who were making poor choices and messing up their lives, he said those people are like sheep without a shepherd. They need help. They need lifted up. They need the support of the people of God. They don't need condemned. They know where they failed better than anybody else. And he agreed with that. So that was, that was pretty cool. But the only time he got mad was at the self-righteous religious leaders who were abusing their power and abusing God's word for their own gain. And I would just steer you to Matthew chapter 23. He just slammed them over and over and over. And he's like, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You think you're all that. But you are in deep weeds when it comes to God. Go read it for yourselves. I don't have time this morning to, to take care of that one. Married couples do this all the time. Let's bring it home a little bit. I don't do a lot of counseling, but I'm aware of a lot of situations Married couples that keep score. It's crushing to a relationship. There's, yeah, Tony Robbins. The minute you start keeping score, you're destroying the relationship. And that's not just marriage. That's every relationship. Work, friendships. Who wants to hang around someone that's always reminding them of what they did wrong? Now, Aaron Chambers shared a list, and I'm going to share it with you, of lessons I've learned about keeping a record of wrongs against someone. These, I think, are quite applicable, quite practical. Number one, no one is perfect, so there's always enough wrong to fill every page every day and not skip a line. If my wife wanted to, she could just fill page after page every day 
of ways that I don't love her as she ought to be loved. I'm glad that she doesn't because I wouldn't put up with it. Number two, Aaron says, is a book of record of wrongs will always serve to convict the one who did the wrong. So you're always, you always win when you present your record of wrongs before a judge or jury of your peers. You can go before a judge and say, look at all he did to me, your honor. And you've got the evidence. It's right there. And all you can do is go, I have no defense. It's a slam dunk. It's a win for the prosecution. If you keep a record of all the wrongs done to you, number three, you're always in a position of power, which we just talked about. Whoever has the book has the power. So if you're in a relationship and, and this is you, you're keeping score, you hold the power in that relationship. And it's critically important. You'll never give that up, by the way. Apart from the work of God on your heart, you'll never give that up. It's of the flesh, is how the scripture would put it. Number four, if you choose to keep a record of wrongs, you will kill that relationship. If you're going to do this, you might as well, at the very end there, add in a last will and testament. Because that relationship's going to die. And you're going to bury it. And there won't be too many people coming to the funeral. And then, encouragingly, number five, Jesus loves us better, so he doesn't keep a record of wrongs against us. Isn't that good news? Amen. Jesus loves us better. Now, to flesh this out a little bit, I want to go to um, 2 Corinthians, but I just want to say before I do that, that there's lots of scripture that addresses forgiveness. It's there in the Old Testament. Jesus taught about it directly. Unless you forgive someone else, you ain't going to go to heaven. He told stories about it. He told parables. The letter writers of the New Testament, they all hit it to some degree. Or another. There's lots of ways we could go around looking at this. But I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and talk about forgiving people, letting go of your record of wrongs against them based on your identity in Christ. I've, I've never quite heard it put this way, and I, I, think, it's, I think it's valuable. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For the love of Christ, Paul writes, controls us because we have concluded this. That one has died for all and therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who might live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And there's a lot there. I'm, I'm not going to flesh all of that out. But what I want you to notice, first of all, is that first line. The love of Christ controls us. This is critically important. This needs to be true. You're going to love better. You're going to make a difference in your world if the love of Christ controls you. If the love of Christ does not control you, you will feel the need to keep a record of all the wrongs done to you. But then notice the line that says, he died for who? He died for all. Which means Jesus died for the person whose wrongs you're documenting. That person that you're indicting and prosecuting and keeping a record of their wrongs, Jesus died for that person. Which means you're no longer living for yourself, but you're living for that person. You're not in control of your life. They're in control of your life. They have power over you because you're obsessed with documenting their faults. You have become a slave to them. So Jesus died for all, including that person and including you. Because don't forget, you have wronged others. You have sinned against others. You have offended others. So who are you to think that you can sit in judgment on somebody else? These are things we need to remember. He goes on, verses 16 and 17. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. And I think he's referring back to how he used to view Jesus before he realized that Jesus was God and, and was Savior. We regard him no longer. 
Then he says, and this is a great memory verse, if you're looking for a memory verse, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. The key word there is in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, the old is gone, the new has come, you're a new creation, that's your old way of thinking, that's your old way of living, that's your old way of acting, that's your old way of judging, that's your old way of scorekeeping. If you're in Christ, that's gone. Anyone watch the show Hoarders? That's, that's, that's a troublesome show to watch. Any, do we have any hoarders here? You can elbow somebody. Now, this is an elbowable moment there. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're getting ready to load a truck, and it's like, oh, this, well, we are hoarders. And we're actually gotten rid of about a lot, but we're still hoarders. So anyway, a couple of years ago, back in uh, March of last year, actually, Emmy Award production designer Evelyn Sackish had been missing for six months. They found her under that pile of trash in her apartment in New York City. She was killed by all the trash she refused to get rid of. It fell on her and crushed her. My friends, don't let other people's trash crush you. Don't let your own trash crush you because you become so obsessed with it. Call someone, they'll clean it out. They'll help you figure out the pathology that is causing you to hang on to it. Verse 18, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. Now we're getting into the key stuff here, that word reconciled. Reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. If you have scripture, you want to circle that one. Not counting their trespasses against them and trusting to us the message of reconciliation. In Christ Jesus, God has reconciled you to God, which means God no longer keeps a record of your sins. He doesn't count them against you. And as a follower of Jesus, you now have a ministry of reconciliation. This is not a choice. This is part of following Jesus. Is my job is to help reconcile people to God. How do you do that if you're keeping a list of all the ways they've messed with you or messed with others? That's God's job. Your job is to be a part of bringing people to God so that God can clean their record. Otherwise, it's divisive and it's deadly. God saved you. Basic Bible truth. You cannot save yourself. You cannot be good enough for God. You can't do enough good things, say enough prayers, give enough money, go on enough mission trips. Endure enough physical pain. You can't do squat to save yourself. God does it. The prophet Isaiah said, all our righteousness is like filthy rags. And he was a pretty good guy. He was a prophet. And then God gave you a higher purpose. And it is not to be an accountant for all the wrongs that other people have done against him or against you. Verse 19, not counting their trespasses against them. Let's get into the definition of what it means to be lost and what it means to be saved. So very, very simple teaching here. Getting lost means God record of all your wrongs and he counts them against you. You are lost if you haven't done anything about that list. And you are saved God does record of all your wrongs against you. That's what it means to be saved. Is God, God has taken this book and tossed it away. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to be saved. We stand before God and say, Lord, I'm sorry I did this, this, and this. And he's like, I don't see that. No, no, wait a minute, Lord. Are you blind? It's gone. Now, we have a hard time accepting that sometimes. I get that. But if there's someone in your life and all you're seeing is a list of all the wrongs that they've committed, you're playing God. 
and you're doing it poorly because God doesn't even keep a list. You're being evil. You're being hypocritical. And as Bob Newhart would say, stop it. Well, let's get practical here. What about the people who've really hurt you? Maybe it was sexual abuse as a child, and it's just scary how much of that is out there. Maybe someone cheated on you. Maybe they're cheating on you now. Maybe they robbed you of your inheritance. Maybe they stole your business from you. Maybe they stabbed you in the back in a business deal. There's lots of ways that people hurt you. How do you forgive someone who doesn't even ask for forgiveness? Have you, anyone here ever kind of wondered that? I want to forgive, but they're not expressing any repentance. Can I really? That's a tough issue. I get it. Well, how do you forgive someone if they won't even admit they've done something wrong? All right, again, this is from Aaron Chambers, but I think he's, he's spot on here. It's a little bit different from stuff that I've taught in the past, so I want to go with it. Number one, not everyone is capable or willing to apologize for what they've done. That should relieve you of a lot of burden right there. Not everyone is capable of acknowledging or confessing or apologizing for what they've done. Maybe they're dead. You got that grandfather or that weird old uncle that did this stuff way back there. And that stays with you forever, doesn't it? How do you forgive them? They're not capable of acknowledging what they did to you. Maybe they're just dumb. And I don't mean dumb in the sense of being completely idiotic, but just dumb in the sense they're clueless. They just will never realize the hurt that they, the people, do those people exist? They, they, they just will never realize the damage that they did. Or maybe they're the devil. Newsflash. Evil people exist. There are people out there who are just plain evil. And they are never going to say, I'm sorry. Not everyone is capable or willing to apologize for what they've done. I love, I love what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 18. He, he, which is, by the way, a great section of scripture. If you want to go back after this and, and read a little bit more on this, read, read, what, read this verse in context. He's talking about how to get along. But then he says, if it is possible, acknowledging what? It may not be possible. Live at peace. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. <laughs> there are some people you will never, ever reconcile with, period. You can do everything in your power. You write letters, you make phone calls, you make visits, you send gifts, you send money, you do this, you do that, and they're never going to give an inch and Paul says, that's okay. If you have done everything you can humanly do, you're going to have to learn to live with the fact that some people are never going to have peace with you. Many of you know the story of my dad. I feel that I did everything I could. He died and it never got fixed. This is one of what, what do you want? What do I call that? An escape hatch? This is, this is one of my relief valve verses that just allows my conscience to be clean. I, I, feel like, I feel like I did everything I could. And sometimes it's all right to admit pretty much all the troubles on the other end of this relationship. You see, some of us are prone to guilt. We're just, we have, we've, we've sucked up guilt all our life and been made to feel like everything's our fault, that we have a hard time acknowledging. It's him. So I, I, I love this verse, and some of you need to make this your life verse. A 
Aaron Chambers recommends writing letters or emails to people, but never sending them. He calls it detoxifying. Just make, don't, have you learned the hard way like I have? Sometimes I write a snarky email to somebody and I put their address up first and then I write my ugliness and my hand slips and next thing you know, I've hit the NRT and off that thing goes into the wild blue yonder and I'm dead. I never intended that to go. I have learned the hard way. I say what I want to say. Then I put your email address in and make sure it's what I want to say. Aaron says, express what you feel towards someone and then delete it. Get it all out. Swear. Swear at God. Cuss. Whatever. Just, you, it's in you. Let's be honest. It's inside of you. Get it out and then let it go. And, and some people find that incredibly therapeutic. Now, a small percentage of the time, maybe it's right that you send that. But you want to know what's going to happen? I can pretty much guarantee. You're wasting your time. They won't get it. And I don't mean it won't show up in their inbox. I mean, they... They're dumb. Or they're the devil. They won't see what you're saying. Or they'll come back with a whole bunch of list of more offenses as to, it'll just end badly. But it might be good to do that. Not everyone's capable or willing to apologize for what they've done. Number two, forgiveness is an exchange of power. We've already talked about that. Sometimes you just need to walk away from a situation, use all that energy positively for healthier things, take that power from them. If you're consumed with someone and what they've done, just walk away. Just, it's, oh, what's one of our favorite sayings? Me and Kim, we got the saying, you know it. Not my circus. Not my monkeys. It's okay once in a while to say, you know, I am responsible for me. You are responsible for you. I will not waste any more time or energy on this issue. Number three, forgiving and forgetting are not the same thing. This is, this is huge. Now, can we, is it all right if we get practical in a sermon? Is that, or do we have to stay up there and kind of float around with the angels and the heart? I think this is practical. Forgiving and forgetting aren't the same thing. Someone says, oh, just forget it. How many of you have successfully forgotten a deep hurt that someone did to you. How many of you? Put the hand up high. You have six, you, I see those hands. Yes, yes. <laughs> you just remembered it. <laughs> it's part of what it means to be human. God made us with, with a mind and a brain and a memory and emotions and, and the ability to respond to the things that happened to us. And we respond to them for a long, long time. You can't forget. But what you can, do, you, what you can do is control how much you remember. And don't let it become like Gollum. Remember Gollum? In the Lord of the Rings? And he wanted that ring? What did he say when he got a hold of that ring? What did he call it? My precious! He was obsessed with the ring. You can forgive someone and yet not be obsessed with what they did to you. And that, quite frankly, is the challenge. I, I was Googling around and I found this. Maybe it's a pastor's wife thing. I started with my wife and, and all the criticism that, that she attracted. But I found a not-so-perfect pastor's wife website. Yes, they have a website called the Not-So-Perfect Pastor's Website. And, and this woman writes, Each and every day I must choose to forgive and I must remember to forget. Stop rehearsing it. Stop playing the martyr. Stop rolling around in it, letting it stink up every part of my life and ministry. So I'm choosing, it's a choice, I'm choosing to continue to forgive and forget by letting it go. Instead, I'm going to focus on remembering what God has done in order to push out the bad memories. I'm going to work on filling my thoughts with good memories. You can't forget, but 
I, I heard someone years ago bring a message on this, and I think the idea was don't dwell on what someone else has done. Don't, don't play those tapes constantly in your mind. Put your mind on something else. Memorizing scripture is fantastic for this. Christian music is fantastic for this. Push that stuff out with light. It's darkness. Push it out with light. Don't constantly talk to others about it. You're always going to find someone that's willing to say, you know, yeah, you really got the shaft back there. They're horrible people. And they are willing to just tell you how much of a victim you were. Those people are out there. And as followers of Jesus, when someone starts rehearsing the wounds that they've experienced, at some point as a follower of Jesus, I need to say, you know, you need to knock this stuff off. And that's hard to do because now the relationship is on the line because that person is looking for someone to affirm their pain. It's a fine line. But we are called as disciples to say hard things to each other once in a while. So don't rehearse it to everybody else. And don't rehearse it to the person. Every time you see the person, here it comes. Some of you hate going back home to family reunions or or Fourth of July is coming up, the whole family's gonna get together, and part of you is like, ah. Oh. And you're, you, you've already decided who you're gonna sit with and who you're gonna stay far away from because you don't wanna deal with it. Clara Barton was the founder of the American Red Cross. And she was reminded one day of a vicious deed that someone had done to her years before. I, I, I love this story. But she acted like she'd never heard of the incident. And the person pressed her and said, don't you remember it? Don't you remember it? And Clara Barton said, no, I distinctly remember forgetting it. That's what we're talking about. You will never forget it. But what you can control is letting it control you. You can distinctly remember forgetting it. And, and remembering has another benefit, by the way. Remembering how someone hurt you can act as a motivator to not do that to somebody else. You can remember, you know, when this was done to me, I didn't like that. And this is where spouses are great. Because <laughs> they... They know you well enough to be able to say, you know, you're just like. And then you want to get mad because you know they're right. My wife, she's classic at that. All she has to do is when I'm doing something or expressing something or considering something, and all she has to do is say, okay, Al. But remembering can help you. Remember what it felt like and act a little differently. Forgiveness, number four, is always a possibility. Forgiveness may be a struggle for you, and I get that. We talk about why we exist as a church, reach people for Jesus, and raise fully devoted followers. So this is the middle part. Forgiving someone is part of becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus. It's part of discipleship. It doesn't happen overnight. And so it's okay to not be there. But what I would say to you is, If this is a struggle for you, then what you need to say to God is, God, there's no way in hell I'm ever going to forgive this person. Pardon my French, but we're trying to be honest here. That ain't going to happen. The prayer then that you make, instead of a fake, oh, I forgive them, when you know you don't forgive them, the prayer you make is, God, open my heart to the possibility of forgiving them. Now your heart is cracked open a little bit. And and God has got something that he can work with, he can plant a little seed, and you've seen how flower seeds can prosper in little tiny cracks of of cement. Be real with God about how hard this is for you. I love the story in Mark chapter nine. This this guy, Jesus' disciples couldn't cast the demons out of his son. And so he finally comes to Jesus, he says, hey, your, your disciples couldn't cast the demon out of my son, this evil spirit. And, and Jesus said, well, with faith, anything's possible. Do you remember the guy's answer? I believe, help my unbelief. That's a great prayer. I want to forgive. I know I should forgive. There's no way I'm going to forgive. Take that to God and say, open me to the possibility of forgiving. And he will. He will. You'll wake up one morning and your mind is going to go to that situation and you'll go, 
It's, it's gone. The venom has somehow drained from your spirit. Here we go, number five. I alluded to this earlier. Move on. Sometimes a situation demands that you just leave. Jesus sent his disciples out several times in the Gospels to preach in the area communities. And he said, if you go to a place and they're inhospitable to you, they're rude to you, they won't accept you, what did he say? Shake the dust off your feet. Go somewhere else where they'll treat you better. The Apostle Paul and John Mark don't know what happened, but they were traveling together, fellow Christians, on a mission trip. And something happened so severe that they couldn't continue together. So it happens. Ministries sometimes don't always get along. Now, later they did come back together, but for the time being, they shook their dust off each other's feet. And Paul's probably like that young whippersnipper, just thinks he knows everything. He won't listen. And John Mark's probably going, that Paul, he's just so arrogant. He thinks he knows everything. And whatever it was, they went their separate ways. And sometimes you have to leave the person who hurt you behind. I love what Aaron says. He says, you have to love everybody, but you don't have to take everyone fishing, especially when the fish aren't biting. <laughs> Which I got to use the other night with my friends from Alderbrook. The next day, um, Scott Ryder was meeting his brother-in-law at 4.30 in the morning to go out salmon fishing. Like two hours earlier than they're really, I guess, allowed to fish or be out there. Like, why are you going out so early? He said, well, because the last time we went out, someone else beat us to the spot. And there's one spot somewhere up in the river, and they want to make sure that they get there first. And so I asked him, I said, is this true? I said, is it hard to sit in a boat all day and fish with someone you don't like? He's like, it's murder. He said, fortunately, I like my brother-in-law. I can sit in a boat all day, even if the fish aren't biting. You don't have to take everyone fishing. Sometimes it's okay to say, I love you so much, I'll see you in heaven. And I hope you go there soon. It's, uh, you, you, don't, you don't have to like, you have to love everybody. I have to love you. You have to love me, but you're not mandated to spend time with me. And that's okay. There's no mandate in the Bible to hang out with people who aren't safe or who are toxic. You're empowered to leave an unsafe emotional situation. And this really hits home because in the church, we cover it up really well. The, the home life of people can be hellish. And we don't dare take that to church because you're not supposed to have problems in church. I don't know where that came from. We're living on Prince Edward Island and about one o'clock in the morning one night, there's a... And here's this woman with her two daughters, and the woman's bruised, and her second husband has been beating her, and she brought her kids, teen and preteen, to our house, said, can they stay with you? I gotta go back and deal with him. And I'm like, no you don't, <laughs> call the police. She wouldn't do it. She never, she never left him. Probably take a therapist years to figure out why. He died. Oh, about a year ago, I think. I'm friends with both those girls still on Facebook. And we never talked about the incident after that, ever. But I sent one a message and I said, I heard about him. And she said, please don't mention his name again. Had an elder's wife at our church in Maryland. Her first husband was a pastor. And if she wasn't the perfect pastor's wife at church, when she got home, he would beat her. 
bruiser, bloodier. She didn't smile right. She didn't say the right thing. And finally, one day, he went to church, and she got the kids. And she left. One of our friends from Alderbrook that we met with just a couple nights ago. Sweetest little wisp of a woman. First time she ever met my wife. Opened up. That's a gift my wife has. She apparently attracts criticism, but she also attracts people willing to just pour out their life story. Turns out that she grew up in the Christian church. She was familiar with our Bible colleges, Cincinnati, Kentucky. Her husband was very abusive. Her parents said, you're a Christian, you're a pastor's wife. You're not coming home. Eventually she left and married a man who has loved her well. He's an atheist. Isn't that interesting? That the atheist loves the wife better than the preacher. I think one of the worst things Paul ever wrote was in Ephesians chapter 5 where he has this section on men and wives. And you know where I'm going with this, don't you? He, he, he wrote these words. Wives, what? <coughs> Submit to your husbands. And some of you of a more progressive, feministic, liberal persuasion are going to go, ah! why did he write that? And we could talk about why he wrote that. But men have been known to take that out of context and use that as justification to beat their wives up. And it's ugly and it does not reflect well on the name of Jesus or the person of Jesus. And my dad, semi-joking, semi, loved to pronounce to my stepmother, woman, submit. Yeah, ooh, it's, it's semi Joking. What he didn't realize was he was actually acting those words out, being a complete fill in the blank. And when she was killed by a drunk driver on August the 13th, 1985, she was plotting how to exit that marriage because he was very emotionally abusive, not physical but sometimes the emotional pain can be worse. And there's a passage, I think it's in Isaiah 59, that says the righteous perish and no one knows why, but, but, but God is sparing them from further trouble ahead. And I remember years after Margie was killed, discovering that verse, and it's like a... <sighs> she never had to pull the trigger on that marriage. I think that would have killed her. It's okay to move on. Verses 20 and 21. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We are ambassadors. That's every one of us. That's not just preachers or teachers or elders. Every follower of Jesus is an ambassador. We represent a king, and the king doesn't keep a record of wrongs against everybody. He'd love to see people reconciled. And talk about an exchange of power right there in verse 21. God chose, G chose to crucify Jesus. He made him to be sin. So we could get his goodness and his righteousness applied to our lives. That's the beauty, that's the mystery of the gospel, that the powerful, holy God became weak and unholy so that we didn't have to face his judgment. God no longer sees our sin, he sees Jesus. So why do we, who are the recipients of his grace, think we have the right to go around refusing to forgive anybody else? It just doesn't make sense. So on the cross, Jesus shredded the record of sins against you, against me, 
And in Christ, nothing's being held against you. In Christ. I've seen relationships die because of this book of wrongs. You've seen them die too. Some of you are beaten up every day by your spouse or some other significant person because they won't let something go. Let me just recommend Come on. Just shred it. Some of you beat yourself up. You may have accepted God's forgiveness, but you refuse to forgive yourself. I remember Margie's daughter, I just talked about Wendy, when she was 19, she had an abortion. And today the popular phrase is, shout your abortion. Be proud of your abortion. It almost killed her for over two decades. As a follower of Jesus, she never forgave herself. And now she has a ministry to post-aborted women. Abortion does a lot more damage than people realize. And she had to shred the record of wrongs that she was holding against herself. Maybe you need to do the same thing. Maybe you feel like God could never forgive you. You've got something in your past you're embarrassed about, you're ashamed about. Let it go. Holding against yourself. God shredder works a lot better than mine. We're going to take communion now. And I just want to ask you, what, what do you need to shred? What do you need to let go of? God doesn't walk, want you walking around in endless guilt and misery. He doesn't want you walking around keeping a record of everyone else's wrongs. As you remember and celebrate God shedding your record of wrongs, is there a record of someone else's wrongs that you've been keeping? And I want, I want you to end that right now. I, I have, we have paper up here. I'm going to invite you in just a moment. Kim's going to play. I've got some Sharpies up here. Just write it down. Fold it in half. No one else needs to see it. But if God is impressing a name or a situation, whatever it takes for you to represent that on the paper, as you come up and take your cup of communion, kind of keep it to one side or the other. That's where the switches are. You put it in the middle, you're, you're, gonna, you're not going to have success. Is there a record of someone's wrongs that you've been keeping? Let it go. And if you haven't already, then I ask you to invite, to, to accept God's forgiveness on the cross. He shredded your wrongs, but you've got to accept it. And that means believing in him and turning from your sin, making the decision, I want to live for him, and confessing his name and being buried in the waters of baptism, which, by the way, the New Testament makes clear is where we get in him, but that's a whole other sermon. And then continuously work on becoming a fully devoted follower being transformed into the character of God. Love keeps no record. I invite you or followers of Jesus to come. And if there's something you need to shred, feel free, take that. Step to the side if you need, write it down, fold it up, shred it, and then enjoy the Lord's Supper like maybe you never have before. But get rid of it.